This is Elena Fast, a criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor with the Brooklyn DA's office. I've handled everything from simple drug possession all the way up to homicides. Today, Elena is going to break down what's right and wrong in some of Hollywood's greatest court scenes. You can see I'm broadcasting from my living room. The criminal justice world is also shut down due to the coronavirus. So our whole firm has been operating from our homes. First up, The Dark Knight. Heads, I'll take it. Tails, he's all yours. Oh yeah, you wanna flip a coin to see who leads? No one ever flips a coin in the middle of trial to figure out who is first chair, meaning lead attorney, or who's second chair, meaning co-counsel, but co-counsel in a junior capacity. Trials are incredibly stressful, and as much as you could plan ahead, you do. With Carmine Falcone in Arkham, someone must have stepped up to run the so-called family. Is that man in this courtroom today? So the witnesses are actually not permitted at trial to give their answer by nodding or by shaking their head. If the witness had done so, the attorney that was asking the questions would have made a record saying, I see you nodding your head up and down. What do you mean by that? Because there is a stenographer that takes down word for word the testimony that is given. Moroni? He's a fall guy. I'm the brains of the organization. <laughs> Order. Permission to treat the witness as hostile. Granted. Asking the judge to treat the witness as hostile means that instead of asking them open-ended questions like you would do on a direct examination of your witness, you ask the judge for permission to ask uh, yes or no questions. And that way you limit whatever the witness is able to say with limiting him or her to yes or no responses. Hostile? I see you hostile! <laughs> So I would say it's probably impossible, maybe nearly impossible to get a gun into a courtroom. Attorneys in federal court actually have it way worse than you probably do through TSA pre-check. They scan all of your belongings, they take away all of your electronics with the exception of maybe a single cell phone if you have a special pass for it. You go through metal detectors, you get wanded, and it's a very secure environment. I haven't heard of a single case where someone was able to bring a gun in to either state or federal court in New York. Next up is Legally Blonde. Get up. What? You're fired. I have new representation. So firing your lawyer mid-trial is probably the silliest thing you could do. If you have any sort of concerns about your representation or how things are going, that should all be taken care of before trial. As much as I love Elle Woods, the attire is absolutely not accurate as to what attorneys wear in real life. There's no sandals allowed in court, and even if you wear a dress, you're still required to wear some sort of blazer or jacket over it. Could have been pink, but she was missing a jacket. Your Honor, Rule 3.03 .03 of Supreme Judicial Court states that a law student may appear on behalf of a defendant in criminal proceedings. This is very inaccurate. This would never happen. No law student would be allowed to conduct a cross-examination of the most important witness on a homicide trial without ever doing a cross-examination or any sort of trial work beforehand. The first case that I tried, I still remember this, it was a search warrant with a crack rock in the bed sheets. It's baby steps. Had you ever gotten a perm before? Yes. How many would you say? Two a year since I was 12. You do the math. You know, a girl in my sorority, Tracy Marcinko, got a perm once. So you do not get to talk about yourself or tell stories when you're on trial. You're not allowed to do this during jury selection or your opening, and especially not when you're examining a witness. 
If, in fact, you weren't washing your hair, as I suspect you weren't because your curls are still intact, wouldn't you have heard the gunshot? And if, in fact, you had heard the gunshot, Brooke Wyndham wouldn't have had time to hide the gun before you got downstairs. As exciting as this is to be on a roll, unfortunately, you don't get to ask compound questions. They have to get separated out. You, however, had time to hide the gun, didn't you, Chutney? After you shot your father. I didn't mean to shoot him. I thought it was you walking through the door. So this is a very cinematic moment. It hasn't happened in my professional career where I've been able to break a witness down to the point of confession. And I can't think of a single colleague that has gotten this accomplished. Next up, my cousin Vinny. Can you tell me? What would the correct ignition timing be on a 1955 Bel Air Chevrolet with a 327 cubic inch engine and a four barrel carburetor? It's a bullshit question. Does that mean that you can't answer it? It's a bullshit question. It's impossible to answer. Impossible because you don't know the answer. Nobody could answer that question. So I don't think any attorney would ever, ever get this close to a witness during their testimony because you, one, are invading their personal space, and two, you're not really sure what reaction you're going to get from them. Watch this. Because Chevy didn't make a 327 in 55. The 327 didn't come out till 62. And it wasn't offered in the Bel Air with a four barrel carb till 64. So this is the number one thing they teach you in law school, and that's not to ask any questions that you don't know the answer to, especially when this is done at trial before a jury. So this is lawyering 101 gone bad. Next up, Bob Angerman. Now, are you trying to tell me that this knife really fell through a hole in the boy's pocket, someone picked it up off the street, went to the boy's house, and stabbed his father with it just to test its sharpness? No, I'm just saying it's possible the boy lost his knife, and that somebody else stabbed his father with a similar knife, it's just possible. So this juror is doing what every defense attorney wants him or her to do, and that's question the evidence and hold the government to their burden. This juror does not seem convinced that this knife is so unique that there is no other plausible explanation as to how the crime could have happened. Where did that come from? It's the same knife. It's the same knife. What do you think you're doing? Where did you get it? I went out walking for a couple of hours last night. I walked through the boys' neighborhood. I bought that in a little pawn shop just two blocks from the boys' house. So this is all sorts of bad. One of the things that the judge says is you're not allowed to do any additional research. You can't read about the case. You can't talk to anyone about the case. You also can't go to the crime scene. What the jurors seem to have done is actually gone out to the crime scene to conduct his own investigation. You're asking us to believe that somebody else did the stabbing with exactly the same kind of knife. The odds are a million to one. It's possible, but not very probable. So the government's burden is beyond a reasonable doubt and all the defense needs to do is have a shot at there being some other possibility or any other explanation. So defense has no burden in this case. It's all on the government and it seems that the jurors here are slowly becoming skeptical of the government's case. Up next, we have the Lincoln lawyer. You were with Ms. Campbell on the night of March 6th. Yep. We went on a date to the association. Then I took her back to her place for another date. And did you have sexual relations? About 400 bucks worth. And she earned every single cent. So in real life, this would be a lot longer, a lot more thought out. This witness does not appear to be a sympathetic person or someone that the jury would like. If anything, the jury would think this guy is a sleazebag. And if this is how he is behaving in court, he may be responsible for hurting the woman and for punching her. That is not something that would happen in real life because the prosecutor meets with the witnesses a handful of times in order for the prosecutor to kind of clean them up a little and put forth the most presentable version of the witness to the jury. When you left, Mr. Talbot, what condition was she in? Was she hurt? No, she was fine. She did not look like this. Man. What kind of sick bastard does something like that? So as the defense attorney, I would probably object to his characterization of someone as a sick bastard that is incredibly prejudicial 
And what you're trying to do is for the jury to make up their own mind rather than rely on anybody else's characterization of your client or the actions. Isn't it true that before you left Ms. Campo's apartment, she asked you to repeatedly strike her in the face with your left fist? Your Honor, Mr. Haller is just muddying the waters with outrageous statements. So the defense job is to muddy the waters. It's not necessarily to get your client an acquittal, but every little bit helps. If the jury's sitting there and they're thinking, well, there is another explanation for these injuries. And if you have the jury thinking that something else may have happened, you're getting closer and closer to either a hung jury or to a not right acquittal. If the jurors have doubts, they can't convict. Do you know a prostitute named Shaquille Barton? <laughs> Work name is uh, Shaquilla Shackles. Yeah, yeah, I seen her once. And if I brought her in here and she said, yes, Mr. Talbot, he, he did strike me with his left fist in my face, she'd be lying. So this is why a lot of preparation goes a long way. It's very common for defense attorneys to hire investigators to develop their strategy. I can't tell you how many times we've been able to dig up dirt or discover really unfavorable things about a witness even if they had nothing to do with the case. Next up, law-abiding citizen. In light of Mr. Shelton's economic means and his potential flight risk, the egregious nature of both Mr. Ames and Mr. Darby's deaths, the state requested bail be denied, Your Honor. So what we just watched was an application by Jamie Foxx's character to the judge, not to set any bail on a matter, but instead keep the matter on what's called remand, meaning no amount of bail or money will get an individual out until the resolution of the case. I am not a flight risk, and this is my first alleged defense. And the prosecution has not presented one single piece of evidence against me. Now, in these circumstances, unless the state has obtained some new piece of information relating to my involvement in the matter in question, then I find it highly prejudicial, even constitutionally offensive, to keep me detained without bail. So this is a phenomenal bail application by Gerard Butler's character. And it's very impressive for someone that's doing this without an attorney. I think in real life, an attorney would still be by his side. It's way too risky to let an individual without presumably any special legal training to make a bail application on a double homicide case on their own. I will grant bail in the amount Your of- Your Honor, I will caution you not to do that. <laughs> Thank you. Excuse me? No, I don't think I will excuse you. You see, this is what I'm talking about. You were about to let me go. Are you kidding me? This is why we're here in the first place. So I think uh, bail on a double homicide is exceedingly rare. It seems that he has a huge issue with the judge just buying his pitch and considering bail based on what the conduct is in this case. Um, I've seen defendants tell the judge to go sit on it or curse the judge out, but that's typically done not when bail is about to be granted, but when bail is set too high or bail is denied. Last up, we have Fracture. Mr. Beecham, I see a man who dresses for court. I'm very sorry, Your Honor. Very sorry. It's a long story. I mean, it happens where you end up wearing the wrong thing to court. I have a colleague of mine that can't figure out his brown shoes. So at least the, Mr. Beecham apologized to the judge for wearing a tire that is not necessarily court appropriate, but at least he's got a jacket on. Do you wish to enter a plea at this time? There's not guilty, but I also want to waive my right to counsel and represent myself. Surely you won't have trouble finding an attorney, Mr. Crawford? No, but I want to do it myself. So individuals are able to represent themselves in New York that's called going pro se, where you act as both the individual on trial and also as the attorney. Typically what happens is even if you don't want to get an attorney, the judge makes you get an attorney not for the purposes of them conducting the proceeding, but for the purposes of acting as your legal advisor. Ms. Crawford wants to go pro per. That's gonna take a while. Sadly, I won't be here for it, but people have no objection. 
Your Honor, I'd uh, like to um, waive my right to preliminary hearing and go direct to trial as soon as possible. Uh, does that help you, Mr. Mitchum? So waiving a preliminary hearing and going straight to trial is an irresponsible thing to do for the defense. Generally speaking, time is on the side of the defense when it comes to criminal matters because the attorneys and the investigators really need to get up to speed on the case and figure out as much information as they can because the government most likely has been on this case for weeks, months, in some situations, even years. You don't have to worry about Mr. Beach and Mr. Crawford. The district attorney's office will assign another prosecutor. No, I like Mr. Beecham. Mr. Beecham, he likes you. I mean, district attorney's offices have, in some situations, hundreds of prosecutors. And uh, I wish we could pick who we did cases with and make my job a lot easier. Now that we've seen a few of these clips, we know that Hollywood doesn't always get it right. So if you do have jury duty or if you're testifying at a court proceeding, just please remember none of us are that good looking in real life.